All right. Uh, now, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, we um, have uh, Alison Sandlin with us today from USA, and uh, she will take us through how benchmarking is done in US onshore and how it fosters competition and continuous improvement. Before I introduce uh, Alison, I would like to give little context of why uh, we are doing this. Uh, we have been talking uh, within our force uh, network uh, that there should be more openness about data. Everything is digitalization. We are trying to share the data. And then I wanted to show how in US actually this has revolutionized the production. So here uh, you see on the screen uh, 2000 situation in 2010. US onshore oil production was almost non-existent. The dry gas production too was quite low. The US oil production had peaked at some time in 1970 and it has been just falling. And then some people always, whenever you are kind of cornered, you innovate. And they thought, yeah, we should be able to hydraulically fracture the source rock and get oil and gas production from that. They started with the gas in 2010. And once people start getting to know, and this is what Alison will show us, they kind of copy each other. They try to be best among uh, who is doing the best way and the, its history. The production went from uh, almost nothing to 8 million barrels per day, oil, gas, um, almost 70 BCF. And to put this in context with the US or the Norwegian oil and gas production, we had a peak of 3 million barrels per day. They have managed 8 million barrels per day in just these 10 years. 12 BCF per day is our gas production. Just Marcellus area produces 12 uh, BCF per day. That's what it is. And all this has come through almost 10,000 to 12,000 new wells per year, which have been fracked. And then these are the digital solutions that uh, will Allison will show and Allison today the speaker today she serves as the US onshore uh, non operated asset manager in US um, uh, this manages both the onshore upstream and midstream assets and partnership in uh, Appalachia basin and the US northeast and that makes up 33% of Equinor's total international portfolio Alison holds a BS uh, bachelor's in petroleum engineering uh, with a minor in economics from Colorado School of Mines, uh, where she was also the captain of the NCAA Division II women's soccer team. And earlier this year, she received the 2023 Oil and Gas Investor and Heart Energy 25 Influential Women in Energy Award. So, uh, Alison, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, take us through how uh, the digital solutions in US allow you to be competitive. Yeah, thank you so much for the intro, kind of setting the scene there. Um, and I think for everyone here too, I see there's there's only about 17 people on. So let's keep this really informal today. I don't have any slides, but I plan on walking you through kind of live today, a demonstration of just how accessible um, data is within the US um, to help you uh, help you learn about trends, learn what others are doing. Um, so then you can come up with your own conclusion. I'll say, um, I'll start this by saying too that I've spent time both as a reservoir engineer working for an actively operated asset. I've spent time as a reservoir engineer and evaluation lead looking at acquiring and entering new plays. So having to quickly figure out who, what is the best acreage and why is the acreage, is the wells, are the wells performing because they are the best res reservoir quality or is it because the operators are doing something different operationally that's making the wells perform better? Um, coming to that conclusion quickly so you can put a valuation to buy that position or at least that stakehold. Um, I've done that, and then today I'm now, as Raghu mentioned, managing Equinor's non-operated position in the Appalachia Basin. So, um, 
I use primarily a tool called Inverus to look at data. Um, and data data here in the US, the US is, a, is quite unique from a standpoint that I think there's three things that make the, the US really unique um, from the rest of the world. And it's, I call it the three R's. So we have, in the US, we have the rigs, we have the roughnecks, and we have the rights. So I just pulled up total rig count and the- Yeah, you could and, share your screen, uh, Alison. Okay, yeah, I'm not showing anything. I'm just kind of- Okay. Just talking if that's okay. Yeah. So, right, I just pulled up now the, the in the US, we're running 616 rigs. Global, the global rig count right now is 1776. So 35% of all the rigs in the, in the world are located in the United States. Um, the next thing is roughnecks, just to em employ and populate and keep those rigs, having the crews for the rigs and the completions crew, completion crews and all the pipelines to, to connect to these well bores. We, we employ a, a, a significant amount of roughnecks to be able to keep this industry going. And the third thing, which is probably the most unique about the U.S. is the rights. The rights in the U.S. are mineral rights in the U.S. are owned by private owners. Um, meaning, whereas in Norway, for example, it's the sovereign state that owns the right to the minerals. So look, you have individuals in the United States that owns the mineral rights. So we have to have a way for the mineral, for the local mineral owners to be able to understand when a company is coming to propose a drill well in their drill well in their where they own minerals. How do we make sure that that's governed correctly? and that that's governed properly. And so what ends up happening in the states, in the United States, is each state has its own regulatory agency um, to govern how operators first file a permit to drill a well, and then what data they have to publicly record so it's accessible for all the mineral owners and landowners that might have rights um, to these well bores to be able to see and make sure that things are being done um, legally. So anyone can own these mineral rights. I own mineral rights in Louisiana. Um, they, they are, um, I think Equinor itself has something like 40,000 royalty owners just in the Appalachia alone or mineral owners. So that's, it's a massive amount of people that are get impacted about, about by the oil and gas industry, but it's really that decision, the private ownership that really has caused the need to have public data. And so the software that I'm going to be showing to you today is called Prism by Inverus. I'm not affiliated with this company in any way, shape, or form. It's just what I use as my own as my own tool to be able to look um, at what's happening in the U.S. Um, it's basically pulling from all the various state agency websites data in a way that's easily consumable, and so that you can find various trends. And so when you first open up Prism, you, first of all, can I get a thumbs up if everyone, can you all see the screen here? Is that working? Okay, good. Um, so when you first pull it up, there's a, an element here where you can see all of all of the wells and the map that they have data on. So based off my current filtering, there's almost 2 million well bores represented on this map. Um, right now I have it colored by the various plays. So if we just are going to talk through or different regions. So we have on here wells in the Appalachia or in the Eastern US. We have wells in the Gulf Coast. We actually have Gulf of Mexico wells represented here right now. They've expanded their data collection of Gulf of Mexico as well. The blue is the Permian. And then in the central part of the United States, we have things like the Scoop Stack, the Fayetteville Shell, and then a bunch of rocky mountain plays. So that's like the San Juan, the Powder River, um, the Bakken, and then we have the Western Canadian Shale Basin, which is the Monty and Duvernay. So you can easily kind of zoom in and see all these wells, um, the well count. I'm going to go ahead and filter then today. I think the topic, just so we have something to focus on, is to look at, um, you can see when these wells all came online here, um, but we're going to focus on a few different plays here. So everything is it's very similar to Spotfire if you are familiar with Spotfire, but it's a web-based application. Um, so you everything is kind of filterable here. You have the various attributes here. So I'm going to just filter to um, our the plays of interest um, for today's conversation, which is the Marcellus Shale and the Appalachia region. 
and then the Haynesville Shale in Louisiana. Did I select that? All right. So you can quickly see here, um, we filtered down to about 21,000 wells from the total 2 million that was there. Um, on the, we have different kind of filtering schemes that I've created these these different, what they call widgets up here. So we can look at this. Um, you can see the majority of the well count, 15,000 of the wells have been in the Marcellus, about 6,500 have been in the Haynesville. And quickly you can see who are some of the top operators. Um, you can click to filter. So if you say, I just wanna focus on the Haynesville, if you click and select Haynesville, all the other charts will update live. Um, so you can start to take a look at it. Um, so Chesapeake is one of, is the top as operates. This is by well count here, total number, distinct API. That's the state, the uh, state issued unique well identifier when you file for a permit by the operator. So there's 1100 wells operated by Chesapeake in the Haynesville. And then you can see all the next. If I go, Let's now take that filter off and maybe go to the Marcellus. Sorry. All right. I'm going to just maybe zoom in. I mentioned that this is all done on all of this data it, that this is a this is a software that just pulls data from state agency websites. So I'm just going to show you an example of what that looks like. I'm um, actually, maybe I'll pick someone else. I picked Chesapeake here. Let's see. Let's go down here and I'll just show it, if we have people from um, that work at Equinor here, we can zoom in and see if we can find some Equinor stuff. All right, so Equinor is a small operator in the region. So I've just filtered on Marcellus Equinor, um, Marcellus wells. And you can click on any of these well bores as you zoom in. You can see these are actual trajectories. Um, and click on a trajectory and a little window will pop up. And you can actually see information. This well was the permit was approved by the state on this date. It was started to spud in June of 2013. Um, we finished drilling in October and started to test, and then we completed the well in spring 2014 before bringing it online the next year. There's also the capability here to go to the document. So this is how they get their data in Veris. Um, and it'll actually take you to the website of the state agency. So this is pulling from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So if you wanted to drill a well in Ohio, you have to file a permit with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. They will approve it. And then there are regulations that to, if you want, if you get that permit approved, that you now have to report your production on a monthly basis going forward. You have to report your wellboard trajectory. Um, and whatnot. So all of this is available here and it's public. Anyone can have access to that. Um, all inverses is scanning that data off the state agency website into a consumable way. Um, go ahead, I see a hand is raised. I'm yeah, perfect, um, thank you for raise, asking a question. Yeah, it's Chris here. So my question then is, is yeah, you're showing this data from one particular well, but is this then standardized throughout the US that everyone provides exactly the same type of data from their wells or does it vary from state to state or with it even within the state so it varies from state it can vary from state to state but so technically the governing body is a state age each individual state agency but there are things that are standard state to state just all the states have copied other states essentially um so the fact that you have to have a permit ish from the state that's standard. The fact that you have to report producing volumes on a monthly basis, that's pretty standard. Um, there is one exception like Oklahoma. Most states you have to record, you have to report all volumes produced. So gas, oil, water. For some reason, Oklahoma for a while, you didn't have to report water volumes produced. Um, so there's little nuances, but for the most part, um, things are the things that are consistent are permits 
um, and production volumes. And then um, the other thing that's interesting is that actually state agencies don't re require that you report um, what you what chemicals you pump in the well bores. If you remember kind of the history of completion and completions and fracking, there was a lot of resistance to fracking earlier early on in the industry because there was no regulation in place that you had to report the chemicals and that you pump down hole. The industry band together to form a nonprofit called Frack Focus, and all of the industry just quickly jumped on the bandwagon that wagon that they dis, they elected to disclose everything that they pumped in the well bores. So now it's common practice that any operators that complete or frack a well in the United States, they post everything, their full completion reports uh, um, and chemicals, full list of chemicals on a website. A third party, so it's not a government government um, a government website, but it's called Frack Focus. And this website also pulls um, from that. Um, Ragu? Yeah, listen, uh, I saw that uh, you could show the well paths and so on too at some point. Uh, maybe not here, but uh, within Envirus you had something. Once you select a well, can you show the well path how it is? Uh, um, yeah, so there's like there you can do that within um, within Enverus for sure. You can also, as you can see, all these things down here are different links. So you can actually see the plat of how they were planning to drill and space these wells out on a 2D sense on, on the surface of the earth. Um, so you can actually pull up the documents and you can see who actually stamped, stamped this, the surveyor. Somebody actually goes out from the state of Ohio to make sure that the distances relative to the different lease lines and county roads are all accurate on here. Um, and then also within the actual well platform, um, you can see some things. You can see like, um, I might have too many filters on in here, but you can see kind of in a, a planar sense, like a cross section sense, they do have this capability to look how far are these well bore space from other near other offsetting well bore. So see, I've reached the limit of 10 elements. You really have to zoom in for this gun barrel design, but it is pretty cool. So maybe if I can just come here. Ah, I was just kicked off. Apologies, guys. I don't know why. Give me a second to log back in. Never a dull moment, y'all. Yeah, it's good that it remembers. Yeah, so I'm going to just take off some of these filters that I have in. Actually, this is good because I wanted uh, to look at the gun barrel. You, it's actually really good to see when there's multiple intervals. And I think I had only selected on here only Marcella. So let's get into. There we go. I'm going to just filter back to Equinor here for a second. We'll go look at a little kind of 2D cross section here. So Monroe County, Ohio. Let's zoom in to maybe this pad. And you can start to click on these wells. Oops. And you can start to see that this is a pad that has some offsetting so that you have the Eisenbarth well that is a thousand feet offsetting the 2H Eisenbarth and 780 foot offsetting the 4H. Um, so you can kind of have this is like a cross section through the reservoir and you can look at it. This right now is toe to heel. You can kind of flip it the other direction as well um, to see heel to toe. But this is a good way to see if there's any kind of stacking. 
All right, so we kind of did a zoom in there, explained that all this data is pulling from state agency websites. Now let's see, now that all this data is in here and we understand the source and where this is coming from, that there are some inconsistencies state to state, but having a having a software like this that um, that pulls this data and they do try they do some of the cleaning up to try to make things as consistent as possible um, is really really nice. So I think I put some questions in the abstract to start to figure and let's use that to guide a conversation um, here now. So I'm just going to go back and get my filters on to the Marcellus and Haynesville um, plays. And the first question is, what are the lateral length trends for each play and by operator? Um, so if I come over here, let's get these two plays um, selected. So we wanted the Marcellus, we wanted the Haynesville, and just get horizontal wells. I'm just going to filter out some of the really old stuff if that, just so we're looking at stuff since we know completions. Vintage. All right, well, it's not quite letting me do that. All right. So anywho, let's keep looking at this. So right now we have two plays selected. So we have the Marcellus play that exists up in up in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And then we have the Haynesville play in the Northwest Louisiana and South uh, Northeast Texas. Um, the reason why I've picked both of these plays is the, these plays are um, predominantly gas. So there are two gas plays um, that all, that actually have some consistent operators across both of these plays, Chesapeake and Southwestern. Um, so if we wanted to look at what are the lateral length trends for each of the operators, um, we can see here, we have on this bottom, this chart right here, um, lateral length averages by first three months of production. Um, and then the bubbles are bubbles here are by the vintage of wells. I've intentionally, let's see if I can throw on a legend real quick here. Um, or we can zoom in a little bit. You can see I've intentionally colored these such that anything that's 2016 or older are in gray. Then we have 2017, 2018, and 2019. Um, in different colors of blue, and then 2020 through 2023 in different colors of red, with the brightest red being um, 2023. And you can see in general, there's a trend that operators are drilling longer laterals um, through time. And also you see that the amount of volume that they're able to recover is also increasing. So there's a positive correlation here. The longer laterals you, you, you drill, the more contact you have with the reservoir, the more volume you're able to um, extract from that reservoir. Um, but let's maybe take a look at um, another variable here is on completions, which is propane intensity. So propane being the sand that you pump into the well bore, um, and the intensity is how many sand you pump in relative to the entire lateral length that you pump. So taking the total pounds of propane that's pumped into the well bore divided by the lateral length. And you can see here, there's also correlation. So we're seeing that not only are operators drilling longer laterals, in recent years, they're also pumping more sand per foot in those laterals. And both of these things combined are translating to higher performance. Um, we can select and look at just the Marcellus wells to see the trends of the Marcellus here. Um, and you can see that that trend still holds true. And what's interesting is you're not really seeing a lot of changes in design since 2020 onwards. Pretty much they've kind of all, all the 2020 to 2023 well bores are concentrated around the same completion design. Um, and then if I were to just focus on the Haynesville for a second as well, um, the, some, a similar thing is happening here. Um, though, look, you do see that it looks like the Haynesville well performance is kind of is has plateaued. You're starting to see that the Haynesville wells, while there was a significant jump in production performance between 20, 2015 and 2016, 
um, you're not really seeing that same year over year production um, growth in the Haynesville as you are still seeing in the Marcellus. Um, some other things that you can do is say you're honed in on a part of the play and you want to know um, how is production improved in each play and what is the key driver. Um, say you want to zoom in, you can start to zoom in on a part of the play um, and you'll watch this chart will update. It'll tell you who are the operators in this play portion of the play. Everything's corresponding to this map. So if I zoom in even more into the Northeast Pennsylvania dry gas area, you can see the primary operators are Chesapeake, Katera, Repsol, and Southwestern. So say I just want to focus my analysis to see trends on these four operators in the area. And you can and you can start to see, well, how what are what are some differences between these operators? This chart here, I'm just gonna edit or bring up. I've selected to have lateral length on the x-axis and profit intensity on the y-axis, and then each bubble is by the operator, and then I have it sized by the EUR of each bubble. So the bigger the bubble size, the bigger the EUR. And one trend that just shows up in this chart here is that the smallest bubble also happens to be the bubble or the wells with the, the operator that's using, has the shortest laterals and the shortest profit intensity. Um, whereas the two operators that have the largest bubble size, Katera and Chesapeake and Southwestern's right in there too, for all intents and purposes, I would say that's pretty similar, are the operators that have longer laterals and higher profit intensity. Um, we can also zoom down, um, let's see, I also have another, another dashboard that we can look at, but um, the other thing that you can start to do let me just duplicate this page and go to there's I have another dashboard just really looking at completions so we can jump over to that so you can have multiple versions of dashboards if you really want to look at it um, so let's just get down to very similar filtering to what we just were looking at here so I think I had we were looking in northeast Pennsylvania and we were looking at Chesapeake, Katera, Southwestern, and Repsol. Those same four operators. Um, and what you can see here is, in general, we're seeing flu what I have plotted up on this top left, top right hand chart is the fluid intensity. So not only do you pump sand into a well bore, you pump water to carry that sand down to the to the to the frack. Um, you can see that the average of these well bores have been improved have been increasing in fluid intensity year over year. Um, we can also now zoom in on year over year changes in completion design by operator. So what you have here is each color of dots are the individual, um, each dot is an individual well bore that you could zoom into. Um, and you can see um, 20 Chesapeake swells in 2020 are in this box plot. Um, in 2021, 22, and 2023. So you can see Chesapeake year over year is increasing their lateral lengths. Um, same, Repsol, Repsol is a little bit over kind of scattered, but they do look like they have the least amount of well count so in this sample size, so 55. Um, and then the bottom chart here is well performance. So you can see um, what the average six month production on an MCFE per thousand foot basis is for all of these operators. So it looks like Chesapeake and Katera have some of the best wells. Um, let's just see that could, they don't look, they look like they're pumping similar wells, whereas Southwestern is having, has really long laterals, but their well performance is a lot worse. So why is that? Um, so we can come over here right now and let's maybe change the coloring scheme of this. Oops, color in and see where all these wells are located on the map by operator. OK, and what you can see here is Southwestern's wells. This kind of circle here is the core of the play. So Chesapeake and green and Katera and this teal color are both in the core, whereas Southwestern is kind of outside the core. So while they might have long laterals um, and similar completion design, this is where rock qualities um, matter. 
So I've been showing a lot of charts here that just show the first six month production. So a single snapshot in time of how these well bores produce. Oh, I see a hand raised. I'm not sure how long it's been there. So apologies, maybe Ragu, you can All help right, me I'll if you that. see a hand raise. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Ricardo. Uh, yes, thanks for the presentation. I uh, just have a question in connection to the propane intensity that you showed before. Mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the initial rates or the first three months production. Um, is this in connection to uh, drilling more clusters or is it in connection to drilling bigger frags? Do you know if you can extract that information from Embers or do you have any knowledge of, of, of this? Yeah, so, okay, you asked specifically about clusters, right? So the, there's, many, many knobs that you can change or different de design elements you can change when fracking a well. One is just how much sand you pump in the well, which is what we're showing here. But when you say clusters, I really think about how many stages and shots you're actually penetrating the casing along the well bore. That is sure. data that you can um, isolate and look at here. So let's do it. Let's see what that trend is. Um, so you can see this is a, all the different um, completion variables that are extractable and plottable. So you can look at how, what's the average cluster spacing. Um, let's see what maybe clusters per stage or clusters per shots per 1,000 feet, right? So how many shots that do you have per 1,000 feet into um, breaking through? So looks like we had an outlier year here. 213 wells where they went and had significantly higher shots um, per 1,000 foot, um, but it doesn't look like the well performance really increased by that much, um, which I guess explains probably why in 2022 and 2023 they've backed off um, to probably a cost savings. Um, the more shots you have in a well, generally the longer you are in the well bore, right? just to shoot off the different charges in the well bore. So there's a there's also an efficiency here between um, what's the right level of cost. So there's all if there's a different variable that you'd like to see, we can look at it live and make some analysis. Yeah, in, in in this context, I'm thinking a cluster is is consists of some perforations, but will it mm -hmm. take one cluster will create a um, fracture, right? So I was wondering if, uh, if the propane intensity was correlated to the number of uh, clusters or the oh, yeah, okay. water. Uh, yeah, but maybe I, the I, think, I think we are going into too many details, Ricardo. That's not the objective uh, here. Yeah, it is to show, uh, I think the audience, the rest of the audience from NCS probably don't know all these details of clusters and cluster spacing. And, so, oh yeah, okay, uh, right. I, I thought that maybe you could extract that information from Ambrose. That will be interesting to know. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, I don't know why this is kind of th thinking here. I just yeah, just just for the rest of the audience. I mean, the cluster, uh, these long wells of ten thousand feet, they will be divided into number of stages where you set the packer across the stage, and then you will create some holes with certain spacing that is the cluster spacing within each stage and uh, then uh, yeah you you record all kinds of data and you can back calculate what is what so if uh, and see trends on uh, have you pumped more fluids and more propane per hole that you made in the casing or you uh, pump the same amount but uh, then you reduce the fluid that you are pumped in each hole because you kept that total amount you pump per stage the same and there are different ways of looking at this data and that's what they do to kind of see if anybody else is getting good results by doing something else and is their first year production changing and so on mm -hmm. yeah i don't know why this isn't working for me but yeah all this data is accessible and able to plot, so you could start to deduce some trends from this. Um, generally, I find, or generally, I find the amount of sand that you pump into a well bore is kind of the the 
the primary driver in well performance. Um, and usually the sand, the amount of sand that gets pumped down, it correlates with how much fluid gets pumped into a well bore. And then to be able to physically pump so much sand into the well bore, you have to increase the amount of uh, penetrations you actually have in the well bore, your clusters and shots. So generally the bigger, the amount, the larger amount of sand kind of translates to then more stages, more c clusters and more shots. Um, so these things end up correlating. So if you just focus on one variable, you kind of start to see a correlation between all of them. Um, good. So the next, another question that um, we had in the abstract here is what is the number of days for drilling and completions for each play and by each operator? So if I were to maybe just um, reset my filters here and we can take a look at, um, take a look at that. So, go back so we can also have our Haynesville play showing up. There we go. And so the other thing that this, uh, this tool tracks is, is the days. And so what you can see, maybe we just pick some of the more recent wells. So if I come here to vintage, I'm going to just look at the last three, four years of activity. How long is it taking for wells to come online? Um, so this first chart here, I'm just gonna put it into full screen so everyone can focus on it. Here is what we're looking at is, what is the spud to rig release days for an individual well? So again, each dot here is an individual well bore. Um, and then here we have on the X axis, all the various operators. Now I realize one thing that might actually be really tough to kind of tell in this is that I have still both the Haynesville and the Marcellus play selected. So maybe we can re um, do this at an X axis group. So maybe we do play first and then we can do the operator so we can start to see if there's any um, trends. Actually, that was kind of interesting. Um, and see that there's a lot of variance in the Marcellus play. Um, the average to, of spud to rig release is 175 days in the Marcellus play versus 93. There's a lot less variance in the Marcellus. And then if we go now to the operator, um, oops, exit out of the the big filter you can start to see a lot of this variance is being driven by one operator in the Marcellus EQT. EQT is the largest gas producer in the United States right now. So this is something we could dive into. Um, oh, I see a hand raised, Christopher. Yeah, it's me again. Um, so uh, what are the, the the boxes there and the lines at the top and the bottom? Are they represented like a P10, P, P90 box or? Yeah, you know, I'm not exactly sure if it's P10, P90, but yeah, that's it is some kind of central distribution that mm. this is meant to represent. I don't know if it's P25 or P10, um, okay. but yeah, that's the idea. But can you um, could you could you adjust those yourself to have your own classification? Because mm, I can't see where it's giving you like the mean or the P50 or something in there. So the mean is this the number that's written written in the back here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So you can see the mean as well. Um, the other so, thing that you so to answer a question, a general question I had, you are you can get statistics out of this of what is the mean and the the P50 and the P10, P90, or yeah, or whatever you want to get min and max and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You can, and then also maybe this is another thing that would be really interesting um, to do is say say you really want to know the statistics like EQT is showing something that's really anomalous right now, right? So maybe you really want to dive into, I want to understand why EQT has such variance in their spud day. So you could zoom in on that. And then the other thing that's really um, great about this is that all this data is exportable. Um, so you can actually get a list of all of the 650 well bores that EQT has drilled and extract into Excel if you wanted to the names of the wells where they're being drilled and get all the information on it and create your own statistical sampling in, in Excel. Um, so you can just export it in a CSV file and do your own um, 
your, your own analysis external of this platform. Oftentimes I do that myself. I'll bring in data into Spotfire and do my own analysis, um, but use this as kind of the platform to feed my, um, my Spotfire. Um, the other thing that's really great about this is, right, I mentioned each dot here is a well bore, so you can actually, um, you can actually say, I really want to, I want to understand what's happening here. These well bores that are taking more than a thousand days, spud rig, spud to rig release. Let's see. I don't know why it's kind of like bugging out here. Um, but in theory, you could filter to those wells and actually zoom in and pull the state, the data from the state ag agencies. Um, oh, here. Say I want to just look at these wells that are greater than a thousand. Yep. So now you can see I'm only looking at these wells. You could get in on a map and see where these wells are actually being drilled. It's interesting, they're in different states. So it's not any kind of state agency that's driving this. So there's wells in Pennsylvania, there's wells in West Virginia happening here. Um, but you can kind of start to see that the power, there's a lot of information here. You can see the permit when it was spud and when it finally came online was years later, which is quite unusual. I'm wondering why that is. I know there was an acquisition that happened during this time frame from EQT. Um, so that yeah. there might have been some A&D activity that. Um, uh, Alison, mm -hmm. I think uh, I think we have come to some of the questions. And one of the uh, few questions remaining is if you could show how you are getting the cost data and which operators are having what cost or what is the trend there. Uh, and then we should go for landing, so we keep some 10 minutes uh, later for open discussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's get some of these. Uh, let's take some of these filters out. Yeah, so I think one thing that's important to do say here too is Inverus has also taken an attempt to estimate costs and economics for these well bores. Um, so let's just while we're focusing in on EQT, maybe we can look at, let's look at EQT, for example. So what they will do for an individual well bore is they will actually go through and estimate what it takes to, for that well to cost. So this is an inverse um, assumption. It's not actually, we operators do not report to the state their true costs, but there are some correlations that Inverus uses. So um, operators will report in their quarterly earnings calls, their average well costs, and then Inverus will take that to be able to calibrate um, calibrate their estimates that they use in these tools. They know um, they know the production of the well bore. Um, that's right. I already mentioned that that's um, published pu um, published to state agency websites on a monthly basis, so you know how much volume each well bore has produced. Look, I happen to pick a well bore that's only been producing six months. Um, but you can see that it's um, cumed almost a quarter million barrels of oil equivalent um, in those six months. Um, so then based off the lateral length of the well, the number of days spud to rig release, Inverus will put an estimate of what the total well cost is. And then they'll run econ economics based off of the production of the well bore to see what the MPV of that well bore is. And then what I really look at a lot um, is break even of the well bores. So you can see, since this is a gas play, I'm going to focus on the dollar per MCF um, that the break even of this well bore is 353. Um, I would say that that's not a great break even. Um, I personally like to see. Um, wells that have break-evens lower than the current strip price. So then you can kind of guarantee that you're making money. So maybe we can remove the operator filter and get some more operators in here. And take a look at others. So because this is, um, see, maybe did I have a,
So because Inverus runs economics on all of these well bores, see, I'm going to just. You can um, you can then plot all of the economics for all of these well bores um, in an in an area. So say you want to know. Um, I don't know why I must have a filter somewhere still kind of active on this on EQT as an operator. There we go. So if I kind of focus back up on the core area that we were looking at earlier, where we were looking at these four operators, you know, let's go back to Chesapeake, Katera, Southwestern, and Repsol. You can start to look at the average economics um, for these well bores. And all, just as you can plot, um, you can plot the profit intensity or production. Um, you can also plot the economics for the well bores. Um, as well. So maybe we do by vintage here. Let's see. Okay. Let's see lateral length. And then you have by vintage. So you can kind of you can see that our well bores are in this area are averaging around a two dollar and twenty eight cent kind of Henry hub break even. Um, you can even start to filter. Well, what is what does just let's just look at Chesapeake and how their break evens change through time. Um, we see 2023 and 2022, the break evens have gone up. A lot of that is inflation driven. I'm I'm sure that the actual well costs have been going up during this time frame. Um, we could confirm that that's what is being modeled here. So total well cost. Um, there we go. And then by vintage. Yep, you can see wells are getting more expensive. A lot of that's driven by the longer the lateral, the more expensive the well bores are. Um, you just have more pipe and hole, your rigs on the well even longer. But as we have demonstrated over here, the longer the well is, the more production you have. So there's a balance there between drilling longer laterals, getting more production, and then also having more costs to the point that it erodes economics. So um, this balance is continuously being looked at and evaluated by operators. And everyone is also kind of looking over their other, their neighbor's shoulders and tools like this to kind of figure out are other operators scaling back on lateral length or prop and intensity, or how are they? How might they be impacting um, their total well costs? So totally to to impact their um, economics. Um, so you can see how this can be really useful. The other thing that I think is really cool about this um, is that you can actually extract these economics. Um, so if I come over to be able to model and change the inputs yourself. Um, so if you come over here, um, you can actually extract a single well model of these wells. So it'll take an average of all of the wells. Say you want to only look at Katera's well bores, and I only want to look at the more recent well bores from 2022 and 2023. You can select just that well set. It'll come over here and production data and average those well bores and create a type curve for you. Just kind of what's the average well performance look like, and you can actually download an economic model. And then you've armed yourself with um, some tools here to be able to then to um, create a development plan um, within Excel. I can just. So this this uh, this shows how quickly you can do it, uh, Alison, uh, because all the data is available, and that is something we uh, need to kind of discuss uh, as an application for NCS. What if you had access to this data? What now you just showed is between the two years there is a change in costs, but there is also change in production, and therefore change in economics. And is the direction the right direction? Uh, Yeah, I also see the chat in the in the post about machine learning. 
this is kind of the future of where the onshore industry is going. You know, I, like Ricardo brought up the question about clusters and cluster spacing and stuff like that. There's so many different, you're kind of in the U.S. now we're faced with the problem of having so much data that how do you actually know what's the primary cause? And so um, what's really over the last five years, I think I would say that the industry has really rapidly embraced machine learning. Um, Equinor itself uses machine learning um, to create uh, create production forecast for our producing wells and then also to estimate what production will look like for future wells based off of what the, what the operators individual completion parameters are but it's used it's using um, a very sophisticated data um, data analysis uh, called random we use a, a tree generation a methodology to be able to look at what variables contribute and we're able to take in 20 variables that impact production and then correlate that across the entire basin to predict individually at a given location what well performance is. Our peers are doing this as well, but it's a way to be able to consume big data in a way that's really useful. So I'm glad you linked this. This tool Prism does not do that. Um, there's other softwares that do that do specifically machine learning, um, but this is really for this inverse tool is really for you to look and consume at data in a way that you can come up with your own trends. I could I could add one more thing, Alison, here. I thought in PRISM we could take in different, uh, on the map as the background, uh, different properties like porosity, oh, yeah. thicknesses. And uh, so you see, are, are, is your well in the right area or is it outside the areas? You could import your interpretations that you have uh, to see the correlation between the production performance and uh, some geological properties. Um, and uh, they, they have maps uh, and so on across the whole uh, area. Yeah. I think uh, I think we, we should now open up for a general discussion here. That, that was a plan. Uh, so you have seen how the number of wells were like plus million uh, within the last 10, 15 years. It is more than 200,000 wells and how it is used in US to say always Everybody, it's not a single operator who doesn't monitor other operators' performance. If you don't do that, you're out of business. Can we get certain like this uh, on the NCS? Is there a lot to learn if we can unleash the data? Uh, yeah, just uh, the simple things where you could have how many how many days it takes to uh, complete a well, uh, produce a well, how long they are. Uh, some general properties would go a long way to kind of find the uh, correlations. So what do you think? Any comments or reflections? Yeah, Johanna. Yeah, it's also um, from a personal point of view, I'm very positive to your suggestion. Uh, the question is how to do it. Um, and of course, Equinor is a very large operator. It sort of and and sits on a lot of these data. Um, so the question is, how can we do it, and how to progress it? Yeah, and the the question is, I mean, we have to do some reporting to NPD, and what data is being reported to NPD, and what can be legally and within the current things spread out to softwares like this. Uh, but that's that's a good question. I mean, yeah. um, I, I I think MPD is positive to it. Um, so and I sort of yeah. Are there any from MPD at the moment in the in the audience who's going to respond to that? No, we tried to get them. They were away at some team building, so nobody from uh, NPD uh, is probably in the meeting. But we are recording it, so we'll ask for the opinions after they see this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a discussion that we need to sort of uh, uh, start with. Yeah. Hmm. Or, or yeah. Er, Ragu, can you hear me? Yeah. This uh, is Tor, Tor Blanc. I have problems yeah. with my computer system and setup. But just okay. just one comment. I have been on and off. So, but one thing is important to keep in mind is the fact that in the US you have a big number of wells, which we don't have in Norway. Of course, like the the person said. Equinor has a lot of wells, but compared to what is drilled in the US, it's limited. So uh, we will not get the same benefit, but of course, if we could get 
this type of data so quickly, so good as what was described, it will help everybody after all. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I think we have some 3,500 wells totally. Uh, uh, so it's a big, big uh, away from this 200,000 wells in the last 20 years. But still, I think uh, I agree with you, Tour, that it will be a big step if everything is available so quickly. Ali? Yeah, thanks uh, for the nice presentation. I just wanted to emphasize that uh, in Equinur, we are trying to liberate a lot of data in a similar platform. Uh, but that is not accessible for outside Equinor uh, people. Um, and the idea behind uh, this uh, is to make the data uh, usable and accessible for all of the users. But the, the main um, focus uh, is on the, uh, the, the lot of functionalities that has been mentioned here is covered in our internal tool. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have access to all of the log data and tracer data and all, all of the data that you measure during drilling and uh, production. And on top of that, you have you can add the production and even simulation models to the fields. Uh, it's more like a Google map of Equinor, I could say. But uh, I think there are a lot of synergies uh, here that we can learn from these uh, types of platform. Of course, this one that was shown by Allison is uh, quite comprehensive and it's covering a much larger area than what we cover in Equinor. But still, um, I think we have a long way to go, but I think we have started the journey. So and I don't see that we are, there are big showstoppers here. Mm. Yeah, if I could but, reflect, uh, reflect on that too, like I think it's the, what's unique about the US, right, is that you have private mineral owners that participate or have rights to the revenue of the individual well bores, and they have to have a mechanism to be able to guarantee that they're getting paid correctly. And if not, they have to have a mechanism to be able to sue. So that's where kind of the government has is playing that role to be able to make sure that the individual people that have mineral and land ownership have access to the right information to be able to ensure that they're being fairly treated. So I think when I think about how do you apply this to other areas of the world that doesn't have that don't have that same setup of private mineral ownership, I don't see a way that this can't be done without some kind of consortium or collective collective buy-in um, from the industry and or government to help facilitate this. You know, in the US, for example, I mentioned the completions information. That was an industry-led initiative where the consortium called Frack Focus that all the operators knew that for the people in the in the world to trust us that what we're doing and pumping in the well bore is safe, we need to be able to make it more transparent. So there could be something like that, that a consortium could be formed that everyone all agrees to to provide their data but it takes someone taking the initiative to set it up yeah that's a good point but on top of that we have some legal uh, kind of issues regarding the who owns the data who could see the data who could edit the data so it's not as uh, like as you say the setup in us is different than in europe and uh, People in Europe, I see that they are a bit more protective regarding the like the use of the data and also how to liberate that. But thanks to these uh, initiatives like OSTU, that could help us uh, liberate more data. Exactly, Ali. We shouldn't use that as an excuse, but uh, we should see going forward what should we yeah. do to kind of release the data and yeah. not develop individual solutions, but industry solutions like Enverse yeah. now is usable by all the operators to uh, navigate. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that helps yeah. Uh, yeah, the global yeah, GDP. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I fully agree with you and I will take the message um, to the management, uh, try to point uh, those. So that's, that was really good session. Thanks for sharing. Okay, I think we have come to end of the session, Alison. Uh, thanks again for a very interesting uh, uh, session where you showed how we can do it. That is much, much better than PowerPoint, uh, I would say. So everybody got an idea how you can navigate through 1 million data points. And I think uh, we could have shown even more. There is a lot more. This software has made it available in uh, like a uh, browser interface. 
uh, and it's really quick. Uh, so you could see how much time is saved. Uh, mm -hmm. So thanks, Alison. Uh, this was great. And any more questions, uh, any comments, uh, put them in the chat. It will be open for a short while. And uh, we'll see if this uh, session can be put on the NPD uh, website, the recording. Thank you all. Appreciate the time. Mm -hmm.